without further ado, let's dance with hope, oh, I mean uncertainty. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Dave. So, it's a joint work with Felix de Rogu and Martin Reiner. Uh, let's make the jump to an example. Let's consider that we have a program that calculates the state of the system of molecules, water, uh, and each step calculates force in the of molecules and calculates energy in the system and other properties of the system. Now, when you calculate the forces of each of these uh, molecules, each of these can take a different track. So, you may imagine collisions happening to prevent uh, data range developers putting locks. So, they first execute uh, this uh, interaction, then the other one waits, and when it has time, you update the other one. And now it, we go until the end of this time step. Near the end of time step, most of the interactions have finished, and we're waiting for a couple more to be computed. And wait, 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 and they finally come. And we're done. We continue on to the next time step. Now, the common theme here is waiting. Uh, now, what can we do about it? Can we decrease this, this waiting time? Now, one way to do it is to uh, just remove synchronizations. And in this talk, I will present Dubstep, uh, our framework for selectively removing synchronization and exploring different ways how to do it. In a nutshell, uh, Dubstep removes locks from programs or uh, opportunistically uh, relaxes barriers. In this way, the, resu the resulting programs may be non-terministic and may produce results with different accuracy, but perhaps uh, may increase the performance. Now, what Dubstep does, it automatically explores the space uh, <coughs> determined by these transformations and what trade-offs alternate uh, program versions deliver. To uh, tell something about the accuracy and to characterize the impact of these transformations, the accuracy of the program, uh, Dubstep uses statistical analysis uh, and we'll see in a little bit uh, how uh, Dubstep does it. Now, here's uh, the set of steps in which Dubstep goes. So, these are five stages the Dubstep uh, uses to navigate the search page. So the first step is preparation. The developer prepares a number of uh, representative inputs on which it wants to evaluate uh, the transformations and the accuracy model. The accuracy model consists of two parts. The first part is the output abstraction. Uh, it takes the important part of the output. For example, for water, it outputs uh, states of all molecules, but also output states of the system, like total energies and, total, uh, and, and the position center of mass. Now, this properties of the system uh, is what we, what we actually want to compare when we look at uh, how different uh, transform programs behave. The second part that uh, the developer provides is an accuracy bound. That is a bound uh, on how much uh, the developer is willing to tolerate uh, the error introduced in a program. Given this information, Dubstep first profiles the original parallel program and finds location in which program spends lots of time. And Dubstep also looks at a uh, memory map to see uh, are the memory locations that are accessed from all threads or uh, scattered accesses. Now, what Dubstep finds is that for water application, uh, more than 99% of execution time is spent in these two parallel loops. The first one, interf, is calculating the intermolecular forces. The other one, poteng, is calculating potential energies uh, of a uh, system. Now, once it has that, it looks inside the code that's executed uh, within these loops and finds uh, potential optimization targets. Here's one of these targets. So this computation updates forces for each water molecule. And you can see that it's protected by a lock. Now, what Absolute does, it simply removes this lock. And now, these uh, operations are not protected, and you may experience data races inside uh, of this object. The second thing uh, Dubstep can do is look at parallel four constructs that have uh, barriers. So this parallel uh, four construct is usually implemented in the following way. You schedule threads, you execute uh, the body in parallel in each thread, and you finally wait, you wait until all workers have finished their job only then you continue. The transformation we do is we don't wait for all. We wait only for, for, for a fraction of workers to finish, for example, half, and then instruct the remaining workers to terminate as soon as possible 
and keep going. This way, we don't execute all the work. Uh, now, these are transformations. Programs may produce different results. Programs may do different things. Now, we want to characterize how these transform programs behave in three different uh, aspects. The first part is criticality. We want to ensure that our transform programs uh, don't terminate unexpectedly or that they produce a well-formatted output. The second part is the performance analysis. We want to make sure that uh, the transform program actually runs faster than the original program. The final part is accuracy. How we characterize the effect of, uh, of removing these synchronization primitives uh, and making programs effectively non-deterministic on the accuracy result they produce. And that's what I will focus on uh, in uh, this talk. And we'll see a statistical analysis that can uh, help us uh, un uh, understand better what's going on. So here's how this uh, analysis works. It's an end-to-end -end analysis. So we have our program, and we execute it on the, uh, on the representative inputs. We collect the output that it produces. Now, we apply the output abstraction, and I said for water, that is, we want to take the state of the whole system, like the total energies. We do the same thing for transform program. Now, you can see that the output that it produces may be different from the outputs of the original program, and that's fine. We also compute output abstraction, and then we compare them. For example, we can use a relative dis di distance uh, between uh, the, uh, the values uh, produced by the original transform program. We finally go on and uh, ensure that this difference is smaller than the bound. Now, once we set this stage with transformation and analysis, we can go on and navigate the trade of space. So we look at it uh, this way. We first start introducing one transformation at a time and evaluating uh, its effect on criticality, accuracy, and performance. For the water example, uh, we have three locations uh, where we can uh, uh, change uh, uh, synchronization, which is fun. Uh, the next step is to transform multiple locations in the same uh, candidate program to see if we can get more performance out of them. And uh, you can imagine any search strategy that can find a good set of trans transformations to try together. But if you have a relatively small number of uh, transformations, you can as well do exhaustive search. And that's what we did uh, for water example. So here is what, uh, what the map of the trade-offs look like. So the original program is over here. And y-axis is the relative speed up compared to the original parallel program. The x-axis is the average accuracy loss. Uh, computed by repeating this, uh, uh, this, this program multiple times. Now you can see that uh, this program is a completely different point in this rate of space and can go up to speed up 20% and accuracy, average accuracy loss uh, about 5%. Now the main question that I'd like to address here is uh, how confident can we be about these observations, especially observations about accuracy? Uh, and uh, can we go beyond uh, just try more simulations, the better, uh, that is, can we put some hard bounds on what we see over here? Here's uh, what, what, what we do to, to get the bound. We define the execution reliability as the probability that the transform program on the representative input produces the result with error smaller than the bound delta. Now you can see the expression here, this is the difference between the original and transformed result, smaller than the bound delta, and the probability of this event is equal to p, to the reliability. Now it's very hard to model uh, p precisely, because overall it depends on many factors like hardware platform, operating system compiler, inputs that you run it on, so on. So instead of modeling it directly, we can do a different thing. We can specify a minimum acceptable reliability R for our execution, and then ensure that whatever the real uh, reliability P is, it should be greater than uh, this minimal R. Yes? Is this a Bayesian probability or a frequency-based probability? So 
it, it will be, in the end, uh, the test I will show will be frequency-based probability, but it will be uh, a suppression test, so. Okay. All right, and we can talk about it uh, uh, later on more. So here's one way how you can, uh, one general way how you can think of uh, uh, analyzing. So you can just repeat execution <coughs> number of times and then collect observations. So each observation is equal to one if the result, is, if the result difference is smaller than delta, zero otherwise. Then you compute some uh, statistic based on this observation and return yes if uh, it's, great, it's greater uh, enough by, than, than uh, minimum probability R, otherwise you return no. The question that remains is how to select N and what guarantees you can get. So here's what we desire from a procedure that would uh, that would uh, uh, do uh, this statistical analysis. So is that N on the same input? Or hmm? the Sorry? So it's on the same input. Yes. So input is fixed. The, the randomness here comes only from, from the different scheduling. And different scheduling are function of, uh, of, of, of inputs, open system, uh, hardware, and everything else. Are you doing anything to deliberately permute the scheduler or not? Uh, in this experiment, not. So let's take an analogy with a, a game of darts. And imagine that we want to check if a darts player is a good one or a bad one. So what we do? We look how they throw darts. And if most of uh, darts fall in the, near the pool side, then the uh, player is probably good. If they throw off, uh, way off uh, the uh, dartboard, we say the player is bad. And the same thing we do with these uh, observations of program executions. Now, we have only a finite time to analyze uh, and to observe what, what, what every dart player is doing. So we may always have a probability of error. However, good news is that we, uh, that we can control it. So this is this wrong decision rate side. The test says yes when you should have said no, and says, and says no when you should have said yes. And also, there are players that are neither good or bad, and there's a tight bound where you cannot really tell if a player is good or bad. And for that, this is this total region epsilon where uh, you say, I don't know. As I said, we also want to quickly determine very good or very good, uh, or very, very good or very bad uh, transformations. Now, very bad transformations, you will see throwing darts uh, completely off uh, the board. Very bad, very good would hit bullseye all the time. So we looked at uh, statistical tests, and here's one test that can uh, actually uh, do the, uh, that has these properties. It's called sequential probability ratio test. It was developed by Abraham Wald uh, in uh, the midst of uh, the Second World War, and it was actually used to, uh, to ensure how, uh, to ensure the quality of uh, products from, uh, uh, from uh, factors. This test, uh, I can talk more about it later on. If, David, if you, if you have a question, we can discuss it uh, at the end of this talk. Uh, but uh, if we set it in the following way, for example, we set these values for the acceptable reliability, for the probability of wrong decision and tolerance region, the program that always uh, says yes, that, that always produces a, uh, a result uh, within the error bound, that is, it always hits the region near the bullseye, will say yes, that has to say yes after 100 runs. If program never produces acceptable result, the program will say no after only 10 runs. If program is somewhere in between, you will need more than 100 runs. Now, here's what you get uh, for uh, our example program. If you set the error bound delta over here, uh, you will get these two programs. One program where you just remove synchronization in the interact function, another program where you apply uh, synchronization interact and also relaxation barriers for uh, both parallel loops. So here is what uh, this uh, expression is saying. It's saying that on average, in nine out of 10 times, the error uh, of this program on the representative input will be uh, smaller than the bound 
uh, 0.05. And that's the first sentence. The second sentence of the test says, I'm confident 90% that the previous sentence is correct. And this is, uh, this is the expression that Dubstep gives to the developer. Now a developer can go on, look at first at these programs and see if, if they uh, match their intention, uh, his intentions and, how they, and, and whether they are acceptable or not. From there on, the developer may either accept them or do more analysis to, to ensure how these transform programs behave. So how, how is this translated to different inputs? Hmm? How is this translated to different inputs? So if you have multiple inputs, uh, you repeat it so on all that. You mean generalization? Yeah. So the test does not really say anything about generalization for all the inputs. But what you can, uh, so, they, so test doesn't say anything about it. However, what you can experience uh, with the actual inputs is uh, some sort of continuity. And it's like, uh, have, again, uh, let me return to the example with a darts player. So although you, 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 you observe your darts player throwing only in a single bar, single distance, and single set of darts, uh, you may have confidence that it, that, uh, it, that it will replace, uh, do a similar thing uh, in a different context, for as long as it's fairly similar to your, to your original context. But this is all the inductive argument, so this is not something that tests uh, will answer. Okay, at this point, uh, I will shift gears, and uh, I'll actually uh, tell you a bit more about other things you can do within this framework of uh, analyzing the trade-offs between accuracy and performance. If you, instead of a uh, parallel program start with a sequential program, and you start introducing synchronization primitives inside of it, you will actually get uh, our tool, uh, Quick Step. Uh, and this, we, we can go even more. So other things we did was we just want loops to run faster, so we skip some of loop iterations. And then we get loop perforation. Or we want to deal with uh, command line parameters and make our program dynamic, we'll get dynamic knobs. If we have map reduce like tasks, and if we have uh, different functions of institution for map task and sampling at reduction nodes, and you want uh, guaranteed optimal trade-offs between these under some uh, uh, conditions that functions have some nice properties, then uh, you will get uh, uh, this framework in operate that we build. The, the next uh, thing is what I show today, and that is dubstep. If you have the parallel program with four loops, and you start removing blocks and protecting barriers, and you want to explore the straight of space, uh, this is what you get. As a wrap up, I want to say a couple of words uh, about uh, what, we, what we've seen uh, in the discussion about uh, what is thing that we can guarantee back to a user. And it's true both for applications and APIs. So we can have several sorts of guarantees. One case of guarantees is hard logical guarantees, the worst case guarantees. Then we can have, but we can have another set of guarantees, like probabilistic guarantees, that would say, with this probability, this event happens, and I'm 100% sure about it. And statistical guarantees, that would say, this is what may happen, and this is my confidence that this thing happened. Lower level is empirical guarantees, that say, here's, here's what I ran on some inputs, and here are the results that they have. Uh, of course, all of these have a decreasing order of power, but all of them are actually better than the last one that I haven't shown, and that is just uh, visual thinking. Let's try it, and I have no idea whether it will work. All right, at this point I will end this talk, and I can take questions. Yes? So the example just goes of a bunch of time step and goes, uh, so it seems like a system. Right. Mm -hmm. And so it could be the case that probabilistically changing your, 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 um, your, your estimate of convergence is going to act a little bit like annealing or genetic algorithms actually improve the algorithm. Uh, it 
it's not. There's no convergence like that. But there are many cases where that would be true. It's not just. Let's let's come back to this one during the free discussion.